So hello everyone, welcome to all. Uh, a few housekeeping matters. First, uh, before I introduce Ross, uh, there are no Chatham House rules today, uh, so there are media present on the call, so uh, you can attribute uh, what people say to uh, the person. Uh, a few no-go areas that uh, we want to emphasize, first is domestic politics, uh, and secondly, uh, Ross and NAB are in a blackout blackout mode ahead of uh, earnings results, so we'll respect that. Otherwise, this is simply a very um, informal fireside chat, so if you can imagine that uh, Ross and I are in a, in a bubble, um, which is a topical noun in itself, in a lounge in a place somewhere in a backcountry farm with a fire on, and chatting to each other uh, will and certainly enable participants to uh, ask, ask questions through the Q&A button uh, on your page, please do that and I'll pick up uh, those questions that are the most popular towards the end of the session. We've budgeted for about an hour um, uh, total and we'll just see how that goes. Um, but I'm, uh, I'm looking forward to uh, this discussion, which will start off with an understanding of who is Ross uh, himself. So Ross, could you say hello to everybody, please? Hi, Craig, uh, and uh, thanks for the introduction. And thank you, Jeff. Uh, nice to be chatting to predominantly uh, New Zealanders and uh, a good bunch of Massey alumni. Uh, fond days for me. Um, Massey University, uh, they're still etched in my brain, uh, and New Zealanders still home, even though I live in Australia. So uh, nice to be with you all. Thank you, Ross. Um, let's just kick off with a um, sort of a, a, a lateral thought, which is to uh, start off with a quote from Lewis Carroll in Alice in Wonderland, where Alice says, would you tell me please which way I ought to go from here? And the Cheshire cat says, well, that depends a good deal on where you want to get to. Alice replies, I don't much care where. And the Cheshire cat says, when well, it doesn't matter which way you go, Alice says, so long as I get somewhere. And the Cheshire cat says, well, Okay, you're sure to do that, if only if you walk long enough. Ross, you've walked long enough and you've got somewhere. So that's an opposite point to start, but not many people will know much about your background. So if I could just flip back to uh, the Hawke's Bay in your childhood. Um, did you build model aeroplanes when you were a child? Uh, I think we had those little uh, paper ones that you put the wing through the body and the tail through the piece and through those. We right. did those. Uh, but I think too much more elaborate than that. Although I, I do recall having um, one, I think it was a Japanese uh, uh, aircraft at home, a, a green job that uh, didn't didn't take off that well. The reason the reason I ask is I understand your father were flew kitty hawks. He did indeed. Uh, Second World War Australian and the Australian yeah. uh, Air Force, and then when he came to New Zealand and came was actually in banking when he met Mum. Um, he gave that away and actually went um, top dressing pilot uh, in Hawke's Bay. And if you want danger, I'm not yeah. too sure many of them survived. Uh, he right. did. <laughs> Great. Okay. And then uh, Hastings Boys High, um, what subjects did you choose and why? Uh, I, I did a, a, a sort of the commerce side of uh, schooling, um, the old was it, commercial practice. Uh, maths and a few other topics. Uh, you had to do the, the normal English and science, but I was probably more akin to the business side than I was to anything else. Um, so, so, so can you explain to us why your university transcripts at Massey uh, state that you failed uh, accounting stage two twice? Can you explain that to the audience? Yeah, can I just be clear too that I got the first stage okay. It was stage two, 201, I think it was, management accounting. And I must admit, there were a few other things that were a bit more exciting going on in my life at that time, um, uh, being a young fellow away from home. And I uh, yeah. had enough tucked up my sleeve from the first year where I got eight papers, not seven, to at least have one lax year. Uh, I should never have failed it twice, though. Um, yeah. Yeah, too many distractions, Craig. Right, there's... right. So that was the lesson learned, too many distraction, distractions and, and more focus required. Well, you clearly got there after going through um, an MBA in Harvard. So uh, I think that speaks for itself. Interesting about your career though, uh, 10 years at National Mutual in the 90s, CEO of AXA, um, uh, subsequent to the first 10 years, and then switch into investment banking with First New Zealand Capital for a while. 
and then head of retail banking for uh, CBA, then head of retail banking for RBS and uh, CEO of RBS in 2013 to 2019. We'll talk about that in a minute. And now CEO of NAB. So it seems pretty clear that you quite enjoy the CEO role. What, what, what drives you to be a CEO? What, what's, you know, because it has its positives and negatives. Why? What, it's pretty clear from your, your background. That's what you like doing. Yeah, I think it's more around the leadership uh, piece that I enjoy, Craig. Um, you'll see, um, uh, I actually started uh, coming out of university. I went into Unilever, which was uh, both in the food and um, detergents type manufacturing uh, through HR. Uh, and then found my way uh, through more through uh, consequence uh, into the financial services sector, starting off in HR and then moving into the business side of it. And I actually, I enjoy the leadership uh, piece. I enjoy getting results through others. Uh, which is what leadership is all about. And uh, I've, I've always enjoyed it. And I think it's been, as I, I look back on my career, it's more taking opportunities that have actually created the next opportunity. If I hadn't moved out of HR into, for example, um, the sales force of National Mutual, I would never have run the sales force. I would never have then become the CEO. Uh, so I think each of those um, was taking a little bit of a risk, uh, but also um, taking some opportunities that, I think sometimes people miss the opportunities that are put in front of them because they have some linear process of getting to the top or something. So I think I've taken some opportunities that have worked out, worked hard at them, but also enjoyed working with people. So this sort of uh, goes to the, the quote from a Nobel Prize winner who uh, mentioned that uh, luck was somewhat 10% uh, serendipity and 90% preparation. If you weren't there at the right time and had done the work, you wouldn't have seen those doors open and taken those opportunities. Mm. I think that's right. The other side to it too, Craig, when I look at it, uh, you know, we've taken the opportunities. Some of those have mean, meant moving cities in New Zealand, but also moving countries uh, to Australia. I've operated in Australia. This is my third time in Australia. Um, the first move was probably the most difficult. Two very young kids having to move to Australia when we had a house that was not quite finished either in New Zealand. Um, and that was the, probably the first big decision. And what we decided, my wife and I, who's also a Massey graduate, we decided we'd take the opportunity and would turn it into an adventure. And each one now has become the next adventure for ourselves and the family. So I think it's sometimes it's how you look at these opportunities as well. Do you see them as an opportunity or as a problem? And I've always yeah. seen them as a good opportunity. So when you turned up in uh, RBS in London, uh, did you appreciate the kind of trials that you'd have to endure um, and effectively end up in a turnaround opportunity. So just take us, take us through the adversity that you uncovered and how you managed that uh, through to 2019. Well, it was quite interesting um, how I even ended up at Royal Bank of Scotland. Um, I didn't receive the top job at the CBA, which was a disappointment, but you know, Ian Narev was a very good friend of mine and still remains a very good friend and I was hugely supportive of Ian. But after a period of time, you think, what next? And my wife and I were actually in New Zealand at Taupo at Christmas 2012. I still remember it. And she said, so what are you going to do? You're bored. And I said, there's two companies I think I would enjoy working with from a retail banking perspective. One was Bank of America, which was having some difficulties. And the other one was the Royal Bank of Scotland. And without a word of a lie, on the 16th of January, I still remember the date, I got back my first day back at work, I got a call from the headhunter saying Royal Bank of Scotland was looking for a retail head. Um, and, uh, you know, three, six months later, I was there running the retail business and 10 months after that running the entire business. So again, it was seeing an opportunity, seeing something that needed change uh, and not being frightened of putting yourself in a position of uh, having a go at changing for the, uh, something for the good. Uh, and that was an amazing challenge up at the Royal Bank of Scotland as you look back on it after seven and a half years there. Uh, I don't think many executives get that opportunity of turning around a business uh, and turning into something that, you know, makes money now. It's got high levels of capital and liquidity. It's a very solid bank again. And how many executives get that opportunity? And um, you've just got to take those and enjoy them as much as you can. Of course, um, you can't do that by yourself, so you need a team around you. Uh, did you have to make some tough decisions on the people that are around you to engineer the, the changes? 
Yes, and it was quite a, a, a thoughtful process that we that went through to get the right team, but it came first around creating the right strategy for the bank. Because even when I took over, we were still in 38 countries. We had about half our balance sheet out of the UK. Uh, and as we looked at the strategy, we were making all the money back in the UK and our, our strategy was bring it back home. And then there were some people who didn't want to be part of a regional bank, not a global bank. There were some people that didn't want to work in a functional model. They wanted to run a business. Uh, and a number of them worked themselves out of the business. And we, I was able to put people who would understand the strategy and would work with me on bringing the, the bank back home. And we had an amazing team. They were incredibly good at uh, working through the challenges of that business, staying focused, even though for five years uh, we lost money. Uh, my first loss, I think, was about 8.4 billion pounds. It was the mm. largest corporate loss in, in the UK. The first largest was RBS about three years prior. Um, and we were number three. And I think we created, unfortunately, four and five losses, massive losses in the UK before we were able to turn it around. But it was a team of people. They were committed to the job. It was hard to pay them because we were, at the start, 80% government owned. And it was all around uh, a cause, uh, a very clear vision of turning this bank around and, and giving something back into the UK. And uh, yeah, it took us a number of years. And each year when you make a loss, people say you can't get there. And every year the team would back up and have another good go at it. So uh, it was a very, very strong team play. The other theme uh, that you've reinforced in your uh, discussion so far is the retail banking theme. At heart, are you a retail banker? And what, what does that actually mean for this audience? Well, in a strange way, I'm, I'm, not, even, I'm not even a banker. Um, I, I consider myself a, a leader and I happen to be in banking and I've been in banking for quite some time. But I'm sure there are much, much better bankers than I am. But it's around understanding what customers really want and how do you deliver it to them efficiently with a good bunch of people. And I think it was either Ralph Norris or Huey Burrett from the old ASB days who said, you only need to get two or three percent more out of every person in the organization by treating them well and understanding them and you'll outperform everyone else in the marketplace and that's been my view work with your colleagues to actually create a good strategy in a great environment for them and just expect a couple more percent than they would have normally given to somebody um, maybe who wasn't such a good leader so it comes back to leadership and extracting a little bit more out of people because they enjoy the environment they're in and they have a very, very clear vision that, uh, that is yours as well. And, and we've, I think I've been doing that reasonably successfully uh, for quite some time now. Nevertheless, uh, when, you're in the when you're at the top or the apex of a large organization, uh, some of the skeptics amongst us might say information is filtered to you by two ICs and three ICs. So how do you, how do you trust but verify? How do you find out what's really going on, what's really interesting uh, to people at the coalface and by that information understand your customer better? Uh, really good uh, question, Craig. And I'll give you an example of how I've done that here um, at NAB. Um, I spent uh, three weeks full on uh, out uh, with uh, colleagues, uh, our bankers, uh, with customers, uh, in teams, uh, sitting in agricultural cars, going out to see farmers and the likes with our bankers and actually pushed them for the truth about what was really going on and what did we need to do with the bank. And, and when you give people the opportunity, it's amazing what they tell you about what's working, but also what's not. And that was a very strong piece of when I came back and said, now, this is what I've found after three weeks. Here's what we're going to do immediately. I the changes I'm making as of today. Here are the things we're gonna do in the next three to six months. And here are the things we're putting into our strategy that we'll target over the next three to five years. But it's getting with colleagues and encouraging them to just tell you as it is. So I can still visualize being in the uh, Land Rover, uh, sorry, the Land Cruiser with a, a banker taking me through the steps of how do you put a business loan through uh, the process and what steps are completely archaic. And what are we doing now? We're reworking the entire processes of our, our business lending and our, our home lending as well. And we've taken mm -hmm. steps out of it that are completely unnecessary because, you know, over time they get layered in. But that came out of being getting your hands dirty and working out what's going on. 
And that's what you've got to do as a leader. Whilst you believe your team, you have to verify. So it's uh, an old one of inspect what you expect. Uh, yeah. To everybody else to filter it up, you're not going to get the whole story. So. At the same time, um, uh, CO role can be uh, lonely, and that's not the same as being alone. They're two different things. No. But let's just focus on the loneliness. Do you find that, do you have ways of mitigating that loneliness when decisions do come up and they need to be resolved? People are looking at you for guidance. How do you, how do you mitigate that lonely position at the top? Mm. Uh, look, you are on your own. Um, whilst you, I've got an incredibly supportive uh, chairman and uh, Phil Krogan, who's a great banker. Uh, as the chairman, you could, we have very, very good open conversations. So you can have the conversation with your chairman because you trust each other. Uh, and you can have conversations on certain topics with your executive team or as the team together. But there are some things that you end up having to make the call on. And some of that comes from a little bit of experience. Some of that comes from having conversations with people that you very much trust. Uh, having some uh, people outside the organization that you can trust to have a good conversation with uh, is vitally important for a CEO so that you are not on your own. But at the end of the day, uh, the buck stops with the CEO and it truly does, particularly in a very regulated industry like banking. And you have to be prepared to make the call and if you get it wrong, um, you've got to be prepared to wear the consequences of it. And my view has always been never be frightened to actually own the, own the decision. Um, because if you're frightened to own the decision, you're unlikely to make one. And the organisation is based on the senior leader having the courage to make decisions and keep moving. Mm. Um, everyone has a boss. Uh, Phil Cronican and the board's bosses are the shareholders. Uh, your boss yes. is the board. Yes. So, um, you know, everyone's got a boss. Uh, once people get into comments, they appreciate that. Um, do you manage up to Phil? Uh, I, I'm not too sure it's managing up. We have, as I said, we have uh, regular, really good conversations. One of the things I work on and I think Phil appreciates is I never want to surprise him. I never want him hearing about things that I haven't had a conversation with him about. Uh, you know, two nights ago at about nine o'clock, I heard of something that I thought, I'd rather tell him than him see that in the newspaper. Um, the phone calls are made, never shy away from it. So we have a good list of things that, you know, I'll go through with Phil and make sure he's got on whatever he's on his mind, he can share with me, we'll have a conversation. Uh, so you've got to build that relationship. Uh, and if you've got a great chairman and CEO relationship, I think it's, it's, it's very good for the CEO, but it has to be open and frank. And um, it's respecting the position of a chairman. They are there to look after the organization for the shareholders, and that is their job. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, I think it, it helps having a very strong working relationship with your chair, but it's got to be open. He's got to be able to say to me, Ross, I don't like that. And, uh, or I think you should be thinking about that a different way. Um, yeah. so I, I'm lucky, uh, but I've also got a, a lucky in having a, a chairman who is a banker, who has been in the banking industry a long time, uh, who knows how banks work. So we can also have a uh, strong conversation. An example of that, Craig, was when we, I had made a recommendation we should get more capital for this bank, given what was coming on with COVID. And Phil and I had conversations on that. Uh, then it was the decision, do you pay a dividend at the same time as you're going for more capital? And it was very good to have Phil to have that conversation with backwards and forwards, because we knew that would be controversial. Uh, and we, I think, came to the right decision. Uh, we both agreed on the position at the end of the day and I put it out there and we wore it and off we went. So it's, it was great to have somebody who really understood how the shareholder would think, but also how, how banking operates. So, uh, but it, it, you know, maybe a, uh, I'm, I think I'm very lucky to have somebody like Phil as, as the chair um, of a bank such as this. Thank you. Um, one of the things you acquire uh, through experience uh, is a greater appreciation that there's always risks in front of you. They're just different risks all the time. How do you, how have you acquired, let's call it the humility in front of uncertainty? Yeah, well, it, it's, it's, I've always thought about this. This is, it's not about me. I'm, I'm privileged to be the CEO of this great organization, just as I was to run a business uh, being uh, Royal Bank of Scotland, which have had a pedigree of 293 years. I mean, I happen to have a space of six years that I was leading it. It's not my business. 
and you've got to keep remembering that you, you are the CEO in a very, very privileged position, paid well to do the job, but you're there to look after other people's interests and run a business. And I think when you lose your humility uh, and lose that little bit of humbleness, you actually end up making decisions that are about you, not about the organization. At that point, you should go. Um, and I think it's, a, it's the understanding of when it's somebody else's turn. And at RBS, it, in my view was after turning it around, it was somebody else's turn to take it to the next level. So the chairman and I had that conversation. Uh, and I'll be the same here. When I feel as though I've done my bit and I've got somebody ready to take over, uh, you've got to have that humility to say it's somebody else's turn. And I think CEOs make, it, make some poor decisions about that because they think it's about them. And it's not. Uh, and it's got to be about the organisation and what's best. But it's also around your team. Uh, you, you get a lot of energy out of your team. You give a lot of energy to your team as well. Um, you're there to push them along when they're starting to think maybe it, you know, it's, this is getting a bit tough or whatever. Um, so I think you get that. You've got to remain humble in a job. Uh, otherwise, I think just get out of it. It's not a bad job. All right, let's uh, switch uh, tack a little bit into contemporary banking challenges. Uh, and perhaps we can kick off with there's a kind of kind of two sort of things one structural one cyclical but what are your thoughts on sort of post royal commission conduct and culture you know how how has how has that sort of shaped your views of the way forward for banking uh, both in australia and new zealand you know, what does that mean mm. Well, I think the Royal Commission showed that there were some things going on in Banky um, that, that were just not right. And, and a lot of it was to do with um, just not getting the basics right, Craig, in banking. And I think Australia, because it had had 20 to 30 years of good running, a great economy, no recession, uh, I think it had become complacent and it had become complacent in banking as well. And we started to forget as an industry that actually we only exist because we have customers. And I got that lesson very clearly up in the UK after the global financial crisis, when the banking industry created havoc for businesses, customers, individuals, homeowners, uh, when effectively the banking system fell apart. Uh, and let, we'd forgotten about that there was a customer at the end of all this. And I think Australia was not quite at that stage, but they needed a reminder of why we were here and that we are here for customers. And sometimes being here for a customer is saying no. And I keep reinforcing that with my bankers here. Sometimes the best answer for a customer is no, because they will struggle to pay it back. And if that's the case, we shouldn't put them in that position. Um, so I, I think the industry here had lost a bit of focus. That focus is certainly back now through the Royal Commission. And I think you're seeing that come through with COVID-19 and the response from the banks, the regulators, the, uh, the Reserve Bank, both in Australia uh, and in New Zealand, uh, very clearly focusing on what's the best thing that we can work on together to help this country go through this, uh, this um, what could be a disaster. So I, I, I think the lessons are learned, we should never forget them. I think this bank, uh, NAB, had some really strong lessons to learn out of it. You saw how we came out of the Royal Commission. And I think it, it's, it's keeping on reminding itself of those lessons. Um, you know, and when I, I think that a bank uh, wins when its customers win. And when a bank is, uh, and its customers are losing, it's just a disaster coming forward. And uh, we certainly saw our customers having a very, very difficult time uh, here in Australia and in New Zealand. And our response to us to lean in and, and be as helpful as we could. So I think there's been a lot of lessons come out of the Royal Commission. Um, I think. Uh, do, you, do you think? Uh, no, and I think we've we've still got some things we need to tidy up, and there's still some regulation coming through after the Royal Commission that will uh, impact banking and our relationship with customers. Um, you were. Uh, uh, responsible, I think, for quite a lot of change in IT systems in uh, RBS uh, up, up north. And I think you've got some strong views on digital as well uh, in uh, Australia and New Zealand. COVID may have accelerated uh, some of those strategies, Ross, but you want to take us through what you think is the future uh, of banking as it relates to digital solutions? Mm. 
Well, one of the things I, I truly believe is that customers are actually quite happy to do a number of things themselves to do with banking if you make it simple enough for them. Um, you know, for example, if um, right now COVID has, I think, brought forward the reduction in cash, not the taking it out of the system, but the reduction in cash usage, that's probably brought it forward five years. So then you say to yourself, well, what's the impact on things like branches, ATMs? Uh, but you need to have all the facilities for customers to do everything they want to do, I think, on a mobile phone or on a iPad, uh, that they can do it any time they want. And when you allow this, it's interesting to see what customers do. You know, they may apply for a personal loan or a credit card or a transaction account or a business account, you know, at midnight at night. If that's up, but that's up to them. And if you make that facility available through technology in a digital world, uh, let customers do it when they want to do it. And I think that's what you've seen with this virus come through, that customers more and more have actually used the digital channels. At uh, BNZ in, uh, in New Zealand, have set up a line for the over 70s. And what was that to do was to help them actually use the digital channels and teach them how to use them. Uh, now they're dropping that down to the over 50s to actually get them using it more uh, because it was great for them and they loved it. Uh, I had this wonderful um, uh, website uh, posting the other day from a 94 or 96 year old veteran. And he was, like my father, um, flying kitty hawks in the Australian Air Force. So I couldn't he hesitate but to drop him a little note back. And his name was Max, just as my father's name was Bax. So I dropped him a little note. But he was so proud of himself that he'd got onto the digital channels, he and his wife, and basically told us he was no laggard. He was up for this. And I think this is when you make it easy for people and show them how good it is for them, they will use those channels. And you're seeing that more and more now, Craig. And that acceleration will just continue. So do banks become marketing organisations backed up by wiring diagrams at the back? Is that, is that, what, is, what does the structure of banking look like? Well, I think certainly uh, technology is, uh, is going to be the major player for banks to enable customers to do what they want to do. But it's also, I think, uh, the banks have got a very strong role to play using customers' data, using their data for customers, let me be quite clear about that, and what is good for customers, uh, and making um, things available for customers that are good for them. Now, the downside to that is that banks use data to do bad things for customers. Let's forget about doing that. Let's work on how can we do good things for customers, because we have their data, and we can help them with propositions that would be helpful to them. And I think that's the future of banking, is use of data and analytics to be helpful to customers, be they a business customer, and giving them insights and also showing them things that they could do to save money, borrow money to do more things, take advantage of some, for example, some of the um, uh, propositions that the government has put out there now that are very tax effective for them in their businesses. We should be using the data to be helpful to customers. And if you do a good job, they'll do more business with you. You do a bad job and you get a bad reputation and you won't be in business for long. Mm -hmm. The role of a bank, uh, use of data, uh, helping customers uh, is, is the big thing going forward. Um, thanks, Ross. I just want to let the participants know that the Q&A um, uh, is available uh, on the website. Thank you for those that are punching through questions. I'll get to those in a moment. But if I can just continue uh, with that theme of um, technology, Ross, uh, and sort of switch a little bit to FinTech, which you were uh, pretty... Um, pretty keen on advocating as well. Can you explain why open banking is not taking off? Uh, open banking uh, is very, very early here in Australia. It was the first phase of it was July. Uh, and given what COVID was doing in the economy, I think people were so distracted away from it. But I, I, I think it will see that the traditional, this will be a very, very slow pickup and then it'll take off uh, as customers become more comfortable um, parting with their data and handing it over so somebody can give them a proposition back. For about 100 years, banking has said to customers, don't give your data to anybody. And I think that's great advice because there's a lot of people out there trying to steal your data anyway, and a lot of fraudsters out there putting propositions to people that are just not correct. So people have to be very careful. But in a safe environment through open banking, I think over time you'll see uh, financial service organisations using individual data for propositions that will be good for them. Uh, 
But I'd also say the big banks uh, will also use that data to help customers as well. So it's not going to be one way, it's going to be both ways. And I think you'll find um, some fintechs will do very well out of it. And some large banks, if they have a very good data uh, and analytics capability and use open data for the betterment of customers, they'll do very well for, for their customers as well. But I think you'll see it over the next two or three years, Craig, uh, pick up and take off. Uh, you're in a very strange environment at the moment uh, with COVID. Uh, but also, um, I think uh, it'll be a slow takeoff, but when it does, it'll, I think it'll be very, very good for the, uh, the public of New Zealand and Australia, as it's starting to be uh, up in the UK. Okay, uh, let's uh, turn to COVID then. And, you know, you're in lockdown in Melbourne. Uh, we've gone to level three in Auckland. Uh, what, what are your thoughts on working from home and, and how are your offices populated and what are you thinking and planning for um, to manage through the pandemic phase? Maybe if I just give a couple of minutes of um, the history of the bank here as we went into COVID. We had the capability of having about 4,000 of our colleagues able to work remotely away from our main buildings. I, so that they, we had the technology, but only for about 4,000. Three weeks after the COVID-19 uh, uh, hit, uh, we had, uh, other than our branch colleagues who were, you know, still in the branches, we had about 90% of our colleagues working from home. Um, so we went from 4,000 to about 28,000 of our colleagues able to work from home uh, and practically work from home and do their job. And we've been in that position now for the last four to five months. And an amazing group of people who adapted very quickly um, from working in a I'm in a building here that there are three of us in a bubble. Uh, this building has three people. It was built for nearly 6,000. Uh, so, and we've got another one down the road that is completely closed and mothballed. And one up further up Burke Street that's got about 100 of our colleagues in it, in essential roles that probably couldn't be um, done as well from home as in the office in a building again for about four and a half to 5,000. So 15,000 seats and about 100 people all the rest are working from home. We had some glitches in the first week, mainly through outsourced operational contracts uh, overseas, uh, where we had to uh, get our own colleagues to pick up on those jobs. Um, and since then, um, even if we, though we've had so many customers ring and seek support, uh, after about two weeks of that, uh, we were back in incredibly good shape serving customers again. So it shows technology works, but the team had spent three years uh, revitalizing the base of our technology uh, with some work um, that the uh, prior CEO Andrew Thorburn had uh, commissioned and that worked very very well for this bank through the so far through COVID. If we hadn't spent that money I think we would be uh, a lot of difficulties. But we've shifted nearly 28,000 people from working in big buildings to working from home or still working in a branch or the back of a branch uh, and service delivery is still very good. So it shows the adaptability of people if you have good technology. The future is interesting though. Uh, we did a survey recently with our colleagues and said, you know, what shape do you want to come back in? And 80 odd percent of them said, we don't want to come back the way we left. Uh, we would like to actually spend two or three days a week from home and two, maybe two days in the office. Uh, and it's effectively saying, we're actually enjoying not traveling. Uh, we're enjoying not spending the money on the travel. We get more hours in the day here with our family. It's not easy because we've got kids running around us and let's not say it's easy because it's not. It's really hard operating from home, particularly when you've got young kids and you're in a more cramped uh, area, but 80% of them said, I don't want to go back the way I, I left. Um, so I think we have got a structural shift going on here. And uh, I think we should take that opportunity of working with our colleagues uh, to actually get something that works for them as well as uh, for us as a bank and for our customers for that matter. The flip side of the um, of kind of health and safety and uh, staff engagement piece is the government's response. And we won't go there on politics, but can you give us some insights into your thinking on how the funding, the government funding through the RBNZ or RBA QE of government bond issuance ends. How, how, how do you see that runway? How does that 
how's that unfold in Australia and New Zealand? Well, first off, I think um, you and I live in two of the luckiest countries in the world. And I say that not just because I'm a Kiwi, but we've had governments with uh, good discipline around financial running of the countries uh, for the last few decades. And New Zealand and Australia went into this with some of the lowest debt per GDP of any developed country in the world. So we, we start in a great position. Um, and the government, what it, what it gave then the government's ability to actually borrow using bond issuances and the likes um, to actually um, help out. And I think they were in a position because of the prudence of the decades before in a good position to do that and are still in a good position, probably better so than many other countries. And therefore they could borrow. Um, they could actually seek out money from, from bond issuances to fund uh, the work that they're doing today to prop up the economies. Now, this is yours and my money as taxpayers, uh, but I think it's well worthwhile given we do not want um, massive numbers of people unemployed. It's bad enough as it sits today uh, with the disruption that's gone on, but the last thing we want in a very um, established society like New Zealand and Australia is high unemployment, and that both governments are working, I think, very hard to actually stop uh, ending up in a bad position. We've seen here both New Zealand and Australia put in place um, schemes uh, for those to keep people connected to their employer. Uh, we were very supportive of that right at the start and the government here because of a lockdown in Victoria has had to expand that. Uh, they're working on individual schemes that might help certain industries and I think they're going to have to keep doing that because we've closed down big chunks of uh, industries here that we will want to get going again uh, when we find a solution for COVID. You know, big parts of the tourism industry uh, here in Australia, restaurants, bars, um, all those sort of entertainment type facilities have pretty much in some areas closed down in Victoria and other parts is running on half speed. They will come again. Uh, and I truly believe that New Zealand and Australia, if we look back in two or three years time, uh, will realise these were great places to be um, through this COVID and people will want to come to New Zealand and Australia which will again get these economies moving again. I think 2022 uh, is the year we're looking at getting, we think that the economy will be back to where it was uh, when we exited 2019. Uh, so it's a pretty tough two years to get through, uh, but we should be looking to the future of both countries. And I think the governments are investing to make sure we come out of this very well. Okay, thank you. Um, just want to turn a little bit to questions that are coming through. Uh, from S. Coleman and, and others, you mentioned the 2 to 3% lift um, in each uh, team member's effort uh, is, uh, has an enormous impact on the businesses. How do you know when the dial shifted on that? Uh, one of the things we've, uh, we've done both at uh, NAB and at RBS is looked at both uh, colleague engagement and also the leadership score. And this is from honest surveys of our, our colleagues you can't identify who put the, the scores in or the likes and to see whether you can move the engagement because if you can move engagement um, people will do a, that little bit extra which i say the two or three percent of additional effort um, to actually go beyond customers in particular and their other colleagues and we measure that uh, here on a quarterly basis and we're doing it up at rbs on a six monthly basis and, and it does come back to leaders it comes back to the role that leaders play in our business uh, in my view, has always been very firmly a great leader will look after their colleagues and get the best out of them. A bad leader will look after themselves and not look after their colleagues. Uh, and that's not what we want in our businesses. And we've taken these surveys incredibly serious, holding leaders' careers on the back end of poor scores where they were leading up, managing up and not doing it down uh, was never rewarded uh, at RBS and would be the same here at NAB. I want people who are looking after their colleagues to make them successful and that will make the organisation successful. So it's a, it is a very clear thinking about what is the role of a leader. We're about to put in place and we've launched it already in, um, at BNZ, a, a leadership program um, that will help um, build very good leaders because you can teach leadership principles. Uh, and you can teach practices of what you do as a good leader. Um, you and I didn't wake up uh, and become great leaders. Um, these are learned traits and how you do things, these things are learned. And sometimes people need some, some help with it. It's, you shouldn't take it as a given. 
So we're, we're investing uh, over the next three years, about $20 million a year in our leadership program and also in rebuilding the capability of, of our team. 34,000 will get qualified uh, through the FinZero exams over the next um, three years in this bank. Uh, so that is around commitment to colleagues and making them the best they can possibly be. But we need great leaders and that's what we're building. So follow that up with a question that's come through, uh, Ross. What are the qualities of a great leader, both positive ones that uh, you want to um, endorse and accelerate and negative ones that you spot that are just not good qualities? Well, I think with any, uh, with any leader, it's creating the vision for um, their area of the bank. And, you know, so, for example, we have a clear reason for being at NAB, uh, but each area should have its own vision. They should make sure that they have uh, recruited people who uh, they, they uh, make sure that they're very clear about the job that they're wanting to do, uh, wanting the people to do, and very clear about the outcomes from that job. They should make sure they have the capability, being the tools, the skills, uh, the time to do the job. And the third one is just around the motivation. And everyone leaps immediately to money. Actually, it's probably one of the least motivating factors once people get to an okay earning position. It's around the soft skills of motivation of when did we last thank people for doing a great job? When did you have your one-on-one -on -one and ask people how they felt? How were things going? How were they? Um, you know, what, the, all the basics, uh, we neglect sometimes at our peril. And yet those are the things that people are yearning for. And under COVID, for example, and people are missing that conversation as you walk past the desk and have that five minute conversation about the family, you know, and about how you're feeling, how are things? So we're now encouraging our teams to have those conversations with them without talking about work at all on the Zoom meetings. And if they want to have 15 minutes of just social chit chat that you miss because you're not in an office. So we're trying to recreate those little things that make a real difference to people. And what we're finding under COVID, people are under stress, massive stress. But, and, and, you know, when you talk to our bankers and they're dealing with businesses who are having difficulty, and these are people that they've dealt with for years and years, that creates enormous stress. So you have to find ways of vent, letting them vent those stresses and actually having someone to talk to. And when you're physically not there, you have to create that. So it comes back to being very clear about what you want making sure they have the capability, and then they, the motivation, which most of that is, is very soft skills and, and recognition pieces. Uh, I think it's some of the, the traits of a, of a good lead. But start with a bit of a vision about what you want, and then break it down from there. All of that tool. And the poor, the poor characteristics, ones that you uh, think are inappropriate? Uh, Self-interest, managing up constantly. Uh, so making themselves look incredibly good with the boss, uh, all of the time forgetting that the actual colleagues underneath them are the ones doing all the work and they should be the ones being looked after. Uh, and you see that so often. Um, and you've got to stamp that out in an organisation. And you should never promote because of it. Um, you should actually hold them back. Uh, and you see that through your leadership and engagement scores on here on a quarterly basis and uh, on, a, on a six month in some organisations. And you should actually actively intervene. Um, in, a, in a positive way to get the best result, but sometimes those people shouldn't be in your organisation. And sometimes you're better off taking them out. They're better off in some other organisation. If you say to people, and our strategy is around customers and colleagues, is the two twin peaks of our strategy in this organisation. If we're not serious about that and we let people with very low uh, engagement and leadership skills lead our colleagues, what do you think they think? They think you're saying one thing and doing something completely different. So we either get the scores up by be working better with your colleagues, or unfortunately, this is probably not an organisation that we need your leadership skills in, and those are the tough calls you need to make. And uh, I've certainly made those, and we're, um, you know, I'd ask our teams here to work with people to get their scores up, and if not, they're probably not fit for this organisation. Mm, well, thank you. Uh, your comments around... Uh... Uh, stress under uh, Zoom conditions or COVID conditions when you're working from home, are, I think, opposite. I think right now, um, if you compare it to level three, level four, March, April in New Zealand, I think at the beginning it was kind of novel. It was kind of mm. lots of jokes going around on WhatsApp and it was, it was kind of ha-ha. Yeah. Uh, 
uh, as of yesterday, I think here it's quite despondent. It's like, oh my gosh, we're going again. So I expect those issues are going to become more important um, under a working from home strategy and particularly for younger people who don't have the water cooler conversations and the mentoring. Um, next question really runs back to um, your decision making process around one door opening, one door closing, and then the hallway of doors, which one do I choose? How do you weigh up the decisions? Um, you mentioned some of it on the way through this um, interview process, but what, is there any sort of criteria that is a no-go area for you around decision making, moving from one organisation to another? Is it a push or a pull or you know, what, how would you describe your decision making process? Well, first off, I think I, my, my view has always been as I've got one of these organisations, I develop with the team a very clear strategy of what's in, you know, which direction the bank itself is going in, in this case, and what's going to be important and what's also not going to be that important because you can't do everything. So work out what are the areas that you want to be very strong at and where are you going to invest your dollars. Because in a way, a, C, a, a CEO's job is which businesses am I in? What, where am I going to invest the money for the best effect for the organization going forward? Uh, and at what pace am I going to take it? Those are the sort of the big decisions the CEO uh, at the end of the day is there to make uh, and then monitor the, uh, the activities uh, and drive towards that. So I think you've also got to pin your, therefore, your decisions back against, you've got this strategy, you've got this direction for the organization, uh, you've got to pull the levers of the decisions around those. So if it's not related to something, for example, we're focusing on 19 uh, projects here on the bank. We started with 467 things. And I said, it's just ridiculous. Stop it. Let's just get to what are the most important things we'll invest in and then agree those that will make the biggest impact for the bank. And I'll put the money behind them. So therefore, the decision is what don't I fund? And we've used the team to actually align around that. And I must say the team here are doing a very good job of saying, we'll pull this lever, we won't pull this one. And that means we'll put money into that and we'll take it out of here. We're not gonna spend over here for the next year or two, but we're gonna put more money over here. Uh, and I do rely on my team who are very close to the businesses that they operate. Uh, they are running big businesses. A lot of these, if you actually carve them out, you put them onto the Australian Stock Exchange, They'd be in the top 100. So there are big businesses inside a business. Uh, and I do use those leaders to work through what are the, where should they invest, what decisions they should be making. We'll have the conversation, but at the end of the day, I've got to rely on my leaders to, to make the big calls or we'll make them together as a team. Or at the end of the day, the boss will make the call if, if there's disagreement. Uh, but do it against your strategy, do it against the areas that you've said you'll invest in. Um, and sometimes, uh, Craig, you don't get them all right. And I think people are frightened of not getting it right. My view's always been, if you don't get it right, make another decision, right? And make it as quickly as you possibly can. Uh, but also leave people in a job long enough that they have to wear some of the things they've got wrong. Uh, and I think organizations are too quick to move people around and they never see the outworkings of the, work, of the, the decisions they've made and the implementation they've made. They move on to somebody at something else and somebody new has to come in and clean it up. And I can remember being at, uh, at National Mutual when I took over as CEO. It was about the fourth year you started to realise not every decision you'd made in year one and two was a great one. And you had to clean them up. It was probably the greatest learning uh, that, that I had in, uh, as a CEO. At least you're accountable though, which is uh, important. Yeah. yeah. And that's yeah. what you've got to make people uh, and hold them accountable, but be supportive of them with it because you do want decisions made. So that's, that's a helpful answer in a business sense. If you just switch to a personal sense with those decisions, you know, how do you manage work-life balance? Uh, how do you ensure the energy tank just doesn't come from talking to other people, which you mentioned before, but how do you yeah. restock that energy? Uh, look, I'm, I'm blessed with having an amazing wife. Um, she and I met at Massey University uh, and uh, been married for you know, 34, 35 years. And you know, when I go home, we can have great conversations right now. Every night before eight o'clock, we go for an hour's walk and have a, have a chat to each other. Um, it's always been able to you know, have, have somebody that, at home that you've got an amazing relationship with. And most of the time you can leave work behind. I think you have to transition between working and going home. And there's some sort of little routines that you go through. You know, I always change when I get home and put the shorts on. 
uh, and puts sort of uh, a sloppy top on or something that just says I'm not at work and you try and separate it. Um, I've tried to stay as fit as I possibly can um, through cycling and you know I was on the cycle machine this morning uh, and we'll try and get out around our five kilometre area that we're locked into this weekend. You've got to find other outlets than work because uh, you've got to let your brain I think always have some time off. I've been a big one for Saturday and Sundays are mine, uh, they're not work. But if you want me through the week on any work item or at night through the week, I'm, I'll be available. But let's try and give people a couple of days at the Saturday and Sunday or wherever their Saturday and Sunday is, because some people are on shifts, give them the two days that they can refresh and rebuild. Otherwise, they come to work frazzled after a whole weekend of it. Now, there are yeah. some things, Craig, as you know, having been on boards and CEO, you've got board meetings coming up, but Saturday morning might be... Uh, three, but the Saturday afternoon, you might have to be in your office doing some work. Sure. Sure. That is a reality. But if you can discipline into people that the Saturday and Sunday or their equivalent two days is theirs, and I won't ring you unless it's massively urgent, and please don't ring me unless it's massively urgent, uh, I think you start giving people their life back. And I see some leaders that just keep driving and driving and driving. People need a break. Uh, and for my team, I try and give them that on the weekends, um, but I don't mind what hours we have to put in through the week to get the results. And um, I think that's a good, it's, it's worked well for me. I'm not saying it works for everybody. There are others that just love working all the time. I'm not one of those. I like a little bit of time where I can be with friends, family, uh, and do something for, for myself and for my wife. It doesn't appear from the outside, but you might think otherwise or tell us otherwise, but on your travels, have you experienced tall poppy syndrome? Um, I, I probably haven't because um, I, maybe I haven't just noticed it, Craig. Um, the, the, the odd time when, when uh, you know, you, you've got to watch where, where you go and what you say and all those things because you, you, know, you leave a very big behind you as you walk through an organisation and say something. Um, so you've got to be a wee bit careful of that. But I probably haven't. Uh, notice the tall poppy um, the people the people always want to have a go at something you've said in the media but that's the job of the media to find things that are of interest uh, but I haven't noticed it but I, I have seen other people get it you see sports people uh, well and truly and you see it some with some entrepreneurs who have done incredibly well uh, and end up with massive wealth but I've, I personally haven't probably noticed it for myself um, there have been the times in London where you know my wife was put me facing the wall uh, so that, you know, people didn't walk past and go, you know, there's the boy that runs whatever. Uh, but, you know, that was a habit we got into that I'd always be facing the wall all the time. The first few people <laughs> what was going on. But, right. uh, yeah, good bit of okay. to you, I think. Okay, um, so a couple minutes to go. Uh, another question from the audience is around uh, shareholder activism. Um, it may be... Uh, vary depending upon the market that you've been in, but uh, maybe from an Australian perspective, uh, is, shareholder, is shareholder, shareholder activism something that you support, uh, you get worried about? How, how, do you, how do you manage it and see it? Well, I, I've never um, had a difficulty with it because I've never had an organisation that's um, had a, an activist come on board. But usually I think that they've got a point of view um, that uh, probably needs a good listening to to see if there's anything real in, the, uh, in their view. Uh, and as long as for the best interests of the company, not the best interests of the activist who's trying to make some money for somebody else, um, and not the, all of the shareholders, I think it's worth having a listen to uh, and, a, and engaging and at least having the conversation with. Um, but if it's just there to make money for some um, organisation and not, the, not every shareholder, I think I'd have a worry about it and you'd be pushing back. Uh, but I've been lucky in RBS because we had an 80% um, government shareholder down to 62 as I left. Um, there was no point in an activist coming into that because um, you already had somebody who had a, a very strong interest in the bank itself. And, and here I think we've just got to listen to our, our shareholders and make sure that we're responding. But you know, most of it comes out of if you give them a decent return, uh, that's what they have invested for. They want a good return out of your business. Um, but I think we should have, a, have an air uh, open listening uh, but be very cautious of self-interest in it as well. Okay. Um, if I can just borrow from um, uh, Aborigine dialect, uh, they have a, a rite of passage called uh, walkabout. 
and you have left uh, New Zealand, Australia, UK, Australia. Is your walkabout finishing in Australia, Ross? Where would you like to finish your walkabout? Yeah. Um, look, Craig, uh, New Zealand's home. Uh, Steph and I will end up back in New Zealand. Um, we think about that now because this will be the last uh, big um, you know, CEO job I do. We'll want to do something else after. Um, and that, our view is that'll be back in, back in New Zealand. Um, we love New Zealand. I mean, as I say, two luckiest countries in the world are New Zealand and Australia. And uh, I, I just don't think enough New Zealanders and Australians, Australians realise how good these countries are. And I'd encourage every one of them, go spend a couple of years somewhere else and you'll realise how good home is. So home is always New Zealand, always has been. Uh, we'll end up back in New Zealand um, and uh, we look forward to mountain biking and cycling and doing all sorts of things around the, the tracks of New Zealand. Um, and getting back with family and friends. And that was one of the reasons we came back down here to spend more time back home, but uh, it hasn't quite worked yet given the COVID uh, situation. Okay, uh, bearing in mind that you've got Australians and Kiwis on the, on the call or on the um, Zoom, um, if you had to choose between a Barossa Shiraz and a Centrotago Pinot Noir, uh, what's your choice? I think it's it's got to be a, a Central Otago every time. All right. Got to be. Very good. Absolutely. Very good. Hey, well, I'm going to wrap up. Um, it's uh, now yeah, 60 minutes and just thank you very, very much on behalf of uh, CFA. Jeff and uh, Kylie done a great job organising this and I want to acknowledge them as well. I uh, also want to uh, note for participants this webinar has been recorded and the next event is on the 1st of September, which is a, a topic on infrastructure. But right here, right now, on behalf of all of us, Ross, thank you for giving up an hour of your valuable time in Melbourne to talk to us uh, about leadership, leadership through adversity and your, your, your walkabout. So all the very best. And thank you, Craig. Thank you, thank everybody. You, thank you, Ross. Thanks very much, Craig. All the very best. Good evening.